Good morning, everyone. I'm Frank. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I've been through this process with a big book step study sponsor, a patient higher power. Um, people like you, meetings like this, I'm in the uh, process of making amends and I practice uh, all 12 steps in my daily affairs to the best of my ability. Um, yeah, where to start? Well, I grew up in Waltham and moved to Lunenburg in 99. Uh, and to tell you the truth, that was the first time I realized that my thinking and drinking were not normal. Uh, the people I grew up with drank like me. I thought I was a social drinker, you know? And I didn't realize how screwed up my thinking was until I met some normal human beings. And, uh, and it was a shock, you know? And it didn't stop me from drinking. It just made me drink alone a lot more, you know? And uh, so I end up here, right? And uh, I'm gonna read this because it's relevant. You know, I have it on my phone all the time. It's uh, by William James, who they just quoted in here, too. <clears throat> the greatest revolution of our generation is the discovery that human beings, by changing the inner attitudes of their minds, can change the outer aspect of their lives. And that sums up what AA has done for me, right? Um, I came in here, and I thought my only problem was drinking. I didn't need a spirit, a higher power, spirituality. You know, that was for the the low bottoms or the nuts. Um, I didn't need to drink the Kool-Aid of the cult, you know? And, um, and I, le I lived that way sober. I will say this though. Um, I went to a lot of meetings and it kept me sober and I was having a problem with anxiety. And I was an afternoon drinker. <clears throat> I would drink later in the afternoon. And um, if I didn't get to drink later in the afternoon, I have anxiety. And, um, when I first got sober, I could drive to work on the highway, no problem. On the ride home, I felt like I was on ice. This is the middle of the summer. I feel like my car's on ice, and it's gonna flip over, I'm getting these panic attacks, right? My brain trying to get me to drink. So I say to this guy, this old guy I really liked in AA, told him what was going on, and uh, he says, have you gotten down your knees and asked you know, a higher power to remove the obsession and compulsion to drink? And I laughed right at him, laughed. Um, I'm like, yeah, Dave, I'll do that as soon as I get home. And I went home that night with that in my head, right? Because that's what happens in AA. These things get in your head. It's bouncing around up there. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do that. And when nothing happens, I'm going to go back to the next meeting and tell me it's full of crap. And um, so I got down on my hands and knees and I, you know, I prayed to some higher power I didn't believe in um, to remove the obsession and compulsion to drink. And um, nothing happened, right? Just like I thought, nothing happened. No white light, no feeling of weightlessness, you know, none of that. Um, except the next day, uh, I drove home, and I realized when I pulled in the driveway, I didn't have to pull off the highway. And it never came back. And the thought of a drink in the 11 years I've been sober has never again entered my mind. And I didn't, it threw me for a loop, because I just had something happen, it was miraculous. And, I, and it, I, you know, it wasn't my doing. If, uh, if I could straighten out my thinking, um, by myself, I wouldn't be here, right? I wouldn't need to be here. And, uh, and it was a shocking revelation for me. And um, it didn't get me to do the steps, though. Um, I suffered. I made it to about six, actually, it was seven years, because I just looked in the beginning of my uh, big book, and my sponsor, the day we started, which was 3 2018, wrote the step, uh, set aside prayer. Because I told him he wanted me to do the third step prayer, and I read that, and I'm like, no effing way. There's no way I'm doing that. And uh, he's like, all right, we'll try, we'll start you with this set aside prayer. And um, so I made it seven years sober and miserable. I was insane in here. I was just insane. My uh, behaviors were worse sober than when I was drinking. And that's hard to believe if you knew me when I drank. Um, I love bar rooms. And, you know, when I was a bar room fighter, I loved it. And uh, here I am, I'm playing deck hockey, you know, doing something good in sobriety. And I'm fighting kids who are in their 20s. I'm in my 50s. No, that's not smart. <laughs> that's not smart, right? And, uh, and one day I, I, I woke up and I'm thinking, I'm going to die an alcoholic death without drinking. Like, how is this possible? I have road rage. I can't play hockey without getting in a fight. You know, I'm mad at everybody. I, you know, everything sucks. I'm like, what is going on here? Mm. And um, I heard a woman speak and... Um, and she said she was waking up in the morning wishing she didn't. And that's where I was at in my sobriety. Waking up in the morning like, damn it, I didn't pass away last night. I got to go through another day. You know, not wanting to kill myself, but not wanting to be sober. 
and the drink wasn't uh, in my brain anymore, so I didn't have any solution. And we're on, there's a solution, right? And uh, I heard her speak, and she said that she had found a solution. I'm like, okay, here we go. The magic bullet they don't tell you about because they want you to get, you know, drink the Kool-Aid. And she said she did big book step study, and I was like, oh, no. But you know what? My higher power, I think, because I've had a lot of these coincidences in my sobriety um, that aren't coincidences, I start to realize. And um, I knew right away that I had to do it that way because I knew how I am. I'm that you know, corner-cutting, lazy alcoholic. If I can get a sponsor who will let me half-ass these steps, I'll do it because that's what I want to do. And well, you know, half measures avail us nothing. I read it a million times in, in the seven years I was sober. So I knew it was true. You know, I knew if I half-assed it, I'm gonna get nothing out of it. <clears throat> so I got a big book, Step Study Sponsor, and we start going through it. And um, you know, I can remember when I came in here. <laughs> I'd see that book, Came to Believe, and I used to say, yeah, that's the biggest crock of BS ever. I'll never believe, never. I was that belligerent guy they talk about. I'm not gonna need religion or spirituality or any of that. And uh, today, I can't imagine my life without it, you know? Um, it's shocking how my thinking changed, right? Doing these steps and finding a higher power. And you know, for me at first, the higher power, all it meant is, it's not me. And that's, that's how I started. It's not me. My thinking and my, my willpower, you know, my will is bad. It's bad. It's self-centered. It gets me into trouble. It pisses everyone off around me. And that's in sobriety, you know? I mean, never mind when I was drinking. It was, you know. And, uh, and that's all I had to do, and that was how I started. Um, and now I look back and I'm like, there were so many signs that a higher power was intervening in my life long before uh, I wanted to admit it, years before. I mean, the fact that it took away the, you know, the uh, will to drink is, is shocking. But uh, what got me in here? I mean, really, uh, my life was awesome, really, if you, from the outside. Um, I didn't have any trouble, my job, was to fly around the world and drink that they paid me to drink. That was my job. What a perfect job for an alcoholic, right? So I'm flying around the world, paid to do it. Um, I own a house, you know, I have, everything looks great. Um, and the day I decided I had to quit drinking wasn't even a bad day of drinking. I had gone to my neighbors the day before for a deck building party and uh, he's from France, so he started drinking at noon. And, uh, I was done by about, I don't know, eight or nine. I walked home because he only lived right next door. Nobody had to load me on the couch. That was typical for me. You got to carry me in the house. If you take me out, you're going to be carrying me home. And uh, I wasn't liquid. And I woke up that next day, booming voice in my head, your luck's about to run out because I was a lucky alcoholic. Never a DUI, even though I face planted in front of the police, getting out of a car. I mean, you name it. I did it. Accident after, you know, I had an accident in my neighborhood, took out the power to my whole neighborhood, drunk as a skunk, and they let me go. Let me go. They had me in handcuffs at one point. I'm like, oh, I'm screwed. But you know what's funny? When I had that accident, I remember hitting the telephone pole, and everything went into slow motion. I could feel the car flipping upside down, off into the woods, and the thought in my brain was, well, if there's a God, let me see, let, see you get me out of this. And sure enough, what happened? They came, got my car, got it out of there, replaced the telephone pole. It wasn't in the paper. Let me go after I was, you know, there for four or five hours wait with them. They let me go. And um, it was never in the local paper. I never got billed for the pole. I mean, talk about crazy. I just didn't see it, you know? I didn't see it. Um, so I'm in here, and, uh, you know, like I said, belligerent. And uh, I start doing the steps, and... You know, I, I, like step two and step three, when I did it, I didn't really believe it was gonna work for me. I really didn't. Um, I just wasn't that type of guy, you know? I was very self-reliant. My parents died when I was a teenager and grandparents. I was on my own since I was like 17. I just didn't need people, you know? And this was the first problem in my life I couldn't conquer on my own. There was no doing it. If I could have conquered on my own, I wouldn't have ended up at the end of my drinking you know, drinking in my basement after everyone went to sleep and locking myself in there so I don't leave. Because um, if I ran out of booze and I wasn't out cold, I would go and get more. So I had to lock myself in the basement. And uh, it's just crazy. And I look at that and I, and I didn't have a problem with it. You know, that's insanity. And uh, that's the kind of thinking I needed to change. I have a friend in AA who had the... Um, 
the best analogy for alcoholism. Um, he came in, he says, he comes in, he came in here, he had a monkey on his back, right, his addiction. He puts it off in the corner by going to AA meetings and it's in a cage. He said, that monkey's not in that cage. It's in there doing push-ups, eating bananas. And now it's King Kong, right? What other disease does that? Yeah. Chugs along, right? And when you go back to it, it's 10 times as strong as it was when you came in. And I knew that was true. I could feel it, right? I could actually feel it in there. To me, my alcoholism is like an entity, this evil entity, right? And it tries to get me, and it's hammering away, slowly, slowly pecking at me like a chicken, slowly pecking you to death. And um, so what, how do I get around that? Well, the way I thought I got around it didn't work, right? I end up at the end wishing I was dead. Uh, the way I get around it is uh, I did the steps, and I came to you know, believe in a higher power. And I, it, it, I, I don't know how I didn't see it before. I really didn't. Just the insanity of my alcoholism stopped me from seeing it. And um, it's a miracle, you know. It's a miracle that uh, it worked for me. Because when I came in here, it was a last-ditch effort. And I'm like, this is probably not going to work for me because I'm not, you know, that type of person where these things work. And it worked. So if it worked for me, it can work for you. And uh, that's it. I guess we'll open it. Nice. Up.